Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, January 21st, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. I'm not a certified investment advisor. I cannot give you personal financial advice. Anything that you see on a YouTube video or hear from someone, you should always do your own uh, research and your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, so we've been talking about this reopening of China. I've put some other charts up that show the current um, flights internally in China. Um, this is from 314 Research. They kind of, this is a little bit better because it kind of shows you when the start of the pandemic and then through the pandemic in China and what's happening today, uh, it's easier to kind of see what's the real effect of what's going on. And obviously, you know, the reopening um, in December, we had the initial spurt and then look what's happening as we go into the January, the Chinese New Year, all the traveling. So I would say that the, you know, reopening in China is real. Um, again, you know, the anticipation is that uh, the oil demand that was on hiatus because of the lockdowns in China will come back. That's my view. We don't know. That's obvious now that that's going to happen. We don't know in the time frame or the exact volume, but that is going to happen. Um, there's been all kinds of uh, news items on Twitter, anecdotal tidbits here and there of China going out and securing uh, you know, oil cargoes uh, recently in excess of what they have been do doing in the pe recent past. So um, it's not just you know focusing on airline traffic. We've seen car traffic congestion in the cities is increasing. We've seen uh, data on that. And you know the thing that we have to take into consideration, you know, we can't predict this 100 percent, but we can infer that you know if you go from lockdowns, pretty severe lockdowns for three years to rip the bandaid off, you know, we've talked about this before, and go back to a full reopening with the pent up demand. Um, I don't, I anticipate that the Chinese finding folks are going to react like any other human and go on a spending spree. You couple that with the fact, like I've said before, that the Chinese central bank and government is going to juice this thing to really um, put the afterburners on to really get some escape velocity going in the economy. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm, I'm just telling you what they're going to do. And that's why we're seeing, you know, the recent pops we've seen in, I think, energy prices, uh, some other commodities that are typically, you know, driven by, have been driven in the past by Chinese demand, copper, iron ore, things like this. Is it sustainable? Is it just a pop that it's going to pull back because the gravitational pull of the rest of the weak economy around the world pulls these things back in? I don't know. But I think it's interesting to note what's happening. Um, again, as we'll show in some other slides, I think the U.S. is already in a recession. I don't know how bad it will be. Uh, I don't want to play doctor economist here like I'm some PhD, but it's, you know, if you look at the leading economic indicators, things that we've looked at in the past, um, are showing that demand is slowing, um, orders are slowing. Uh, the full effect of all of the rate increases that the Fed has done over the last year, it takes about a year for that stuff to make it make its way through the economy. And so we'll see. But um, again, this is what's happening. We try to report things here in real time. Um, and, uh, you know, oil has done well over the last week and a half or so. So uh, does that mean we're going to $200 a barrel? I don't know. Uh, I don't know where we're going to end up. I'm not a fortune teller, but I will tell you that the companies that we own in our portfolio, in the actionable intelligence alert newsletter portfolio, they have, we've had relatively high energy prices now for quite a while. And most of the companies that I follow or that I even listen to conference calls have paid down a lot of their debt. These companies are no longer, they're, they're just totally different companies. That doesn't mean they're growth businesses. They're still cyclical businesses. Um, they're still price takers. But if you have a sweet spot of oil where you're in the 80s, 90s, $105 a barrel maybe in a range somewhere in there, and it stays like that for some period of time, 
uh, you will see the continuation of what has been happening with a lot of these companies, which is continuing pay down debt. We have one company in the portfolio that issued, you know, like a year ago, gave guidance at certain thresholds of debt, they would increase share buybacks and dividends. And that's what they've done. As the debt comes down, the return of capital to shareholders goes up. No new major drilling plans, no major, you know, acquisitions, get the, get the cash back to the owners, which are the shareholders. So uh, we'll see how long this goes on for, uh, if this is just a spike or if this goes up and then levels off. Um, I don't know, but uh, you know, I hear both sides of the story that the deaths are like overwhelming. The Chinese government's hiding it. And there's a, there's a good possibility they could go back to lockdowns. I haven't seen that. And I don't see the Chinese, you know, when they make a decision in one direction, they typically don't just reverse it immediately. There's, you know, credibility issues and face saving issues uh, that they have to, that they take into consideration. And uh, I just, I, I, I think they would go above and beyond to hide things rather than reverse. Now, if you had like 20 or 30 million, I, I don't know. It's, but I, I don't see that. And it's like gone off the page one, you know, initially during the reopening, there was a lot of consternation in the Western press, you know, because there's a bias against certain countries in the world. So this is a bad decision. There's going to be millions of deaths. The Chinese medical system is horrible. It's going to be overwhelmed, yada, yada, yada. Very well could all be true. I don't, I'm not in China. I'm not a China expert, but uh, that's kind of died down. And there's now more focus on the reopening and what's really happening now. So it remains to be seen. Again, this is uh, copper uh, off uh, US global investors. They like their charts are very colorful. Anyways, this is the copper price in tons. You can see it was coming, you know, deteriorating through 2022, bottomed. And then we've kind of seen, you know, since the reopening, we've seen a push above basically $4 a pound. Um, and you see the 50-day uh, moving average about to cross the 200-day, the declining 200-day moving average. So this may just be a spike. Again, I don't know, but it's telling us something, right? Maybe it's just speculation. Speculators are driving the price up in anticipation of the story playing out. That's a very good possibility. Is this a trend change? Is, you know... You will hear as, you know, we like to take the other side and look at the other side's argument too. Well, there's been a huge property bubble bust there. Um, the demand for these commodities won't be as high. This is what you hear. But again, you know, um, Chinese have also made some other uh, policy changes around the real estate. So we'll have to see how it plays out. But definitely, you know, second largest economy in the world. Um, like I said, you ripped the Band-Aid off. I anticipate a surge in economic activity there. Uh, is it going to be temporal? Is it going to be a new bull market? I, I'm not forecasting that, but I think over the next six months to a year, there's going to be uh, positive, you know, optimistic. It'll be couched here in the West and with a lot of analysts as, you know, you know, people will be tentative to get involved. But I think that you've already seen a lot of the stocks in Hong Kong and in China move, starting to move. So something's happening. And again, are we, I want to point this out, in the rest of the world, i.e. the U.S., for example, are we, we're in the middle of a liquidity tightening cycle. We are raising, the central bank is raising rates and there is quantitative tightening going on. But if you look at the leading economic indicators, if you look at other indicators, which we'll show a few here, it's obvious to me that the economy is slowing down. We're entering recession. So are we closer to the beginning of the of the liquidity tightening, or are we closer to the end of the liquidity tightening in the United States? I would posit that we are closer to the end. Sometime this year, you're going to see a reversal as things start to break in the US. So this is uh, an article from oilprice.com. It's talking about the record amount of coal that China produced last year. I titled the slide, a quote from a Chinese official in the article, it says, we don't want to be like Europe. China produced a record amount of coal last year, although output ended the year with a decline amidst the latest surge in COVID infections. Total output for the year reached 4. Point, let's call it 4.5 billion tons, which was a 9% increase on 2021. Quote, we don't want to be like Europe and transform at the cost of energy security. Okay, let's pause here. 
we've talked about energy security. This is what the focus should be on in a major economy like the US or in Europe, okay? Making sure you have a diverse uh, energy supply system that doesn't just try to focus on one type of fuel source, okay? You should utilize all fuel sources where they make sense, okay? Where the cost, where the supply, where you have an ad advantage. And that's what, you know, everybody has watched what has happened in Europe. Everybody has watched Germany and specifically the energy vende fail. And so why would anybody want to repeat that? It's all about energy security. If you don't have energy security, you have high prices, which calls causes um, a tumultuous uh, cycle in your economy, which can lead to social pressures and political pressures, especially in a country like China. It's not as docile and under control as people think. There are a lot of there are a lot of protests there. There are, people get wound up real easy there. You know, I've said this before. Even in a totalitarian regime, you still have to have the relative acquiescence of the population. You saw there's a video. I think I've mentioned this before. It, when the uh, Iron Curtain was coming down. There were people in Berlin, uh, East Berliners, they were going, trying to go, things were loosening up a little bit before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And one of the Communist Party uh, Central Bureau, Politburo was on TV. And one of the guys misspoke about uh, being able to go into West Berlin. You didn't need to get a, a stamp. You could go in and we would, and then the guys would, he, he was reading something and he read it wrong. And literally, two million. You know, everybody just went to the gate and was going. So you, you could see, watch in the video. The border guards just shrugged their shoulders and opened the gates. That's how fast it can happen. And so, even in a totalitarian regime, that's always on the precipice, right? Because the deal in China is we will. The populace agrees to go along with the political setup there, but the government's going to deliver prosperity. That's the social compact or construct. So not having energy security, having blackouts, having lack of sufficient energy to slow economic growth is not going to work for a country like China. Getting back to the article. They are now declaring that they are taking a step back in order to take two steps forward later. Li Zhang, climate change and energy professor at this university in China, said last year. Estimates show that coal generation capacity expansion in China could reach 270 gigawatts by 2025. That's just the expansion of the existing fleet in China, 270 gigawatts by 2025, which is in two years, which would be more than the total coal generation capacity in the United States right now. So China is going to expand their coal fleet by a, by a factor that's greater than the entire coal generation capacity of the United States. Um, I don't know how you can't be bullish on coal. You know, I've said before, you know, the easy big money has been made, the multi-bagger, but now we're into the situation where, okay, what's the real demand for coal? Is coal supply going to be able to increase? We've talked about why that's going to be difficult because of government regulation, lack of financing, and other things that don't allow for these companies just to go crazy and expand um, capacity. I'm talking about mostly in the West. Uh, this won't be the situation in global East and global South. B but, uh, you know, again, I think you're, you're the, a lot of these coal companies that we have looked at or are invested in, they have paid down their debt. They are generating tremendous cash flows the coal prices, they've enjoyed a period of extraordinary coal uh, prices. They haven't really had anybody come after them for excess profits. And so you have companies with, you know, extreme uh, tons of money, like billions of dollars on their balance sheet. And now they're entering the phase of, okay, well, we're not going to really expand production. We have existing mines that are kind of being left alone. So what do we do with this cash? Well, we've paid down the debt sufficiently. We need to start paying dividends and buying back shares. So that's what you're seeing. That's the phase we're getting into now. Uh, does the growth in supply that could possibly happen in the China, Russia, these other places that's not going to be affected by ESG overwhelm the demand? I don't know. It's possible, but uh, we'll have to see.
but the demand is so high now. I mean, again, as countries become wealthier, the demand for electricity, the demand for energy, again, look at an economy like an ecosystem that requires a certain amount of energy input to maintain and then additional energy inputs to grow. And if you don't put those energy inputs in, then you can't grow. And if you actually cut them back, then you will start to unravel the complexity of that economy and wealth will decline and standards of living will decline. And that's what China wants to avoid. Again, we don't want to be like Europe. Found this interesting. Uh, these little tidbits come up. You know, nobody really cares about Romania and the big scope of things. But I, this is something we've seen in other places, like in Germany also. It says uh, Romania plans to expand coal mine over 100 hectares of forest. So you're basically, again, going to remove forests so that you can get at uh, a new supply of coal because you need the coal to run your coal plants. This is why, again, I'm a big advocate of nuclear power. Nuclear power, I mean, the zeitgeist is changing. It's going to be a big component of people's energy mix going forward. It has to be. Again, uh, I'm extremely bullish on uranium long term, in the mid to long term. Uh, anything can happen in the short term. But getting back to this article, more than 100 acre, hectares of forest in Romania's uh, Gorge region could be cut down to expand a lignite mine. Romania is making a U-turn on decarbonization processes, and the government is again acting contrary to its EU commitments. Well, they're doing that because energy security and keeping the lights on. That's, you know, you can go there, you can go to uh, Davos, you could go to COP 26, 27, 28, whatever, and you can virtue signal and you can get all the accolades from, uh, that's like the Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand. She resigned, she's resigning. She's not going to run for, stand for re-election. And that's what she was all about, right? Um doing what the globalist agenda is, going and getting the accolades, being in Vogue magazine, you know, it's all its all an act. It's all an act. It doesn't mean anything. And uh, in the end, uh, if you don't, if you're, if your people's uh, welfare and prosperity or their ability to have a better life is, you know, infringed upon for a long enough period of time, they'll throw you out. And so why was why would Romania, which is basically teetering between second and third world status, needs tremendous energy inputs? Why would it turn its back on coal? OK, it's not Germany. It's not a wealthy country that can, you know, afford to try to do an ener energy vende that would cost, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars. They have to burn coal. So this is what you get. What people should be doing is encouraging them and coming up with the EU should come up with a standard reactor design. OK, that would be a good thing. And then help these countries get people trained up. Look at the I've said this before. Nuclear hits all the all the bases. Uh, you want to have high tech and high paying jobs. Um, look at the jobs. OK, the length of time for construction jobs uh, to build the plant several years, the infrastructure you need to supply the components. This is all, you know, heavy industry, precision industry. Uh, high paying jobs, the operator jobs in the plant. Um, this is a high, higher tech job. I mean, uh, these guys, these folks make good money, uh, the staff there. And uh, the maintenance is uh, technical uh, type maintenance. Um, so it makes sense. But, you know, instead, you know, we make these commitments because we want a virtue signal, get patted on the head by Ursula van der Leyen in, in Brussels, and then come back and the country's a mess. OK, and you're going to know. So this is what you end up with. The Romanian government adopted the decision to cut down 106 hectare forest without compensation so that the state owned coal mine and plant operator could expand one of its lignite mines, expanding the mine to a capacity of 8 million tons a year of lignite not only increases CO2 emissions, but also means that more than 100 acres of forest will be wiped out. And it also means that People can stay warm, businesses can operate, you can have electricity. Um, again, instead of trying to get patted on the head by the Brussels crowd and the globalists in Davos, why don't you have a real energy policy that encompasses nuclear, okay? Um, and 
because evidently they, people don't run coal mines because they're trying to they're bore us batten off and want to destroy the earth. It's because you require power and it's cheap, easy to do. Okay. And we now know, I mean, I think everybody knows by now that intermittent um, rebuildables can't be the solution if you want to have a modern, stable, growing economy. Now, the argument will be from some Malthusians, they don't want a growing economy. They want the economy to shrink. They want, they think that human beings are a blight on the earth. Um, that's a view of a minority of people, a vocal minority, a minority that gets more attention than it should. Um, but again, we've, we've talked about that before. You know, I was watching the protests in Germany where Greta Thunberg got, had her staged arrest, where the protesters were protesting the surface mining of Lignite, and they had the police out there in riot gear, and they were lined up to keep the protesters in this huge surface miner was bucket surface miner was operating in the background and it was kind of like a whole dystopian and it was overcast day it just was like a perfect you know setup for clown world i mean it was the best representation of clown world you could ever see and uh you know it was funny watching rebel news ezra levant and uh this other guy avi whatever they're at davos I don't know if you've seen the videos. They're going around. They 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 were they got Greta walking down the street and threw all these questions at her, and she's just giggling like a. I mean, she's twenty years old now. She's not a little kid. She's not a Disney you know star anymore. She's a twenty year old person, and they ask legitimate questions. You know, I like what this one guy asked her. You know, from Rebel News, um, you miss so many days of school. How how do you how are you such an expert on this? I mean, there's kind of like smart aleck questions but i found it amusing it's just more clown world it's just you know send in the clowns it's just clown world 100 percent. i've actually seen people defend these people we you shouldn't make fun of greta she's trying to do no 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 no. she's trying to destroy okay civilization she doesn't understand what she's trying to do she's just doing you know well, she's just doing what she thinks is right. She's just trying to destroy civilization. If you're hooked up with that crowd in Davos, you're no particular friend of mine. So anyways, uh, I thought this was interesting. We see this all the time. You know, this is not the this is not just cherry pick. We've seen this happen in Germany where they cut down uh, old forests. We've seen, I think, in another uh, Balkan country, we saw them actually have to try to move a village of villagers to get them out of the way so they could get to some coal seam. So this is the problem. If you don't have a plan... And if you're trying to, if you're a political class that's supposed to be coming up with, and policymakers are just going to Davos and getting patted on the head by, you know, Klaus Schwab and Ursula van der Leyen, then, you know, you're not going to have a legitimate policy. So you're going to end up with this kind of stuff. So this was, <laughs> this was an article in the Wall Street Journal, like I think last week, and the offshore oil business is gushing again. Oh, they finally figured it out, huh? We've been on this story for a while. You know, guys, this is an example of why you have to think for yourself. Had to get a drink of coffee there. Uh, it was obvious that this industry was going to turn around because of the analysis we did about the lack of investment. Buying in early meant sitting there and question yourself because nothing happened in a lot of these stocks that we own that are offshore based companies that service offshore oil or drill or whatever, what have you. And so you buy them. And then, I mean, I'm past that point now. I kind of know um, I, it doesn't affect me, my, men, my mental state or my, uh, I mean, I, like I said, you know, my process, I write things down. If something changes, uh, then I c c revisit. But, you know, this is the hard part for most people. You know, a year and a half, two years ago, when I was buying a lot of these offshore companies for a lot less than they sell for now, you have to sit and wait. You have to sit and wait for the realization to set in, for more money to come in, more people figure the story out. And now you're seeing it all over the media. Um, and I'll put a link to... Uh, Andrew Walker's uh, Yet Another Value podcast. He's done a three-part series on the inflection in the offshore industry, including uh, an interview with the Tidewater Management. 
um, including a pretty good interview and slide deck done by a analyst that's out on his own now that talks about not just the um, talks about the overall inflection, but basically what's happening in the oil uh, offshore oil industry. Um, it is a tremendous inflection because uh, one of the things I didn't didn't know, which uh, that slide deck and that podcast clued me on, there was a whole bunch of discoveries made, but then they weren't developed, right, because of what was going on with pricing and stuff. I'm talking about over the last five or 10 years, and nobody really moved on them. Now, as you got the pricing back up, you know, Brent's at, you know, 87, I think, you're in the 80s, that's... Some of these things can, are profitable at $30, $40 a barrel. And so they know that the oil's there. They're going to go out there and, you know, now develop these fields uh, that they know where the oil is. And so, you know, I think be, the thesis, right, you know, the one minute elevator pitch is this industry is so small now, it's been shrunk because of so much attrition so many country, companies have went bankrupt so much equipment got scrapped that now that like i said you don't need the same uh type of money to come into it to drive day rates higher and that's what we're seeing so anyways the wall street journal evidently figured this out see this is the problem if you wait till something it's like this gentleman that i used to listen to a long uh, maybe 15 years ago he's an analyst at uh BMO, he would have a weekly call. His name was Don Cox. And he was kind of a historian by trade. And so he would always have a comment that said, don't look at the page one story for your ideas to invest because once the media and it gets makes it to page one, I mean, the stories, you know, everybody knows about it. Look for the story that's on page 13 or page 15 that's on its way to page one. And that's, you know, what we're trying to do. And that's what we did with Offshore. So anyways, the Wall Street Journal finally woke up and wrote a big article. And here's some snippets from the article. The hunt for offshore petroleum is on again, fueled by a surge in global demand for energy, supply disruptions triggered by the war in Ukraine and crude prices that remain above pre-pandemic levels. Of roughly 600 rigs worldwide that were available to lease for offshore projects in December 22, about 90% were working or under contract to do so, according to research firm Westwood Global Energy Group. That was up from roughly 63% five years earlier. This is exactly right. Once you get to around 80% or higher of utilization rates, <clears throat> excuse me, once you get to 80% or higher on utilization rates, that's when day rates start inflecting higher. And that's what we've seen. I mean, I'm talking about all across the offshore uh, spectrum. The last boom came to an end in 2014 when oil prices crashed due to a surge of supply from U.S. shale oil producers and a refusal by OPEC, by the OPEC cartel to cut its petroleum output. Many drillers either went bankrupt or had to restructure their debt. Rigs of all types were stranded mid-construction in shipyards, scrapped, or cold stacked meaning shut down and stowed. Drill ships as young as 11 years old were sold for scrap, and the fleet of rigs that contractors were ready to lease was slashed more by 35%. So this, again, is the opportunity. Declining supply, slamming into increasing demand. That's your... Now, what's interesting is if you listen to some of the podcasts of that series that I was talking about with Andrew Walker, because he really deep dives this stuff, you will understand that in previous cycles, when we, we've talked about this too, but this folks that he has on really dive deep into the numbers. You will understand that what typically happened in the past is that these guys in the offshore business, they would get some money in their pocket. And the first thing they wanted to do, because this is everybody always wants to grow, they would go out and start contracting to get new rigs, new drill ships, go into deep debt because, you know, this is a cyclical industry, but, you know, that was the zeitgeist. That was the thinking. That was how everybody thought in the industry. When you have boom times, you need to refresh the fleet, if you will. Well, that's not the case now. First of all, a lot of the shipyards that built these things, they don't exist anymore either. Secondly, that's just like it is in oil and gas exploration and production. There's no appetite to go out and build take on the debt and take on the, the uh, risk of building these things. You know, the industry is going to, is still suffering from P, PS, 
you know, PTSD from the last decline where a lot of companies went out of business. You know, I've said this before when I've talked about offshore, the offshore industry is probably the worst economic depression in the history of, of that industry. And so the mentality is kind of burned into people's minds not to do what they did in the past. And they don't have the ability to do it anyways. No one's going to give them the money um, and the shipyard capacity. Now, eventually, if rates get high enough, which I, they probably, you know, I'm not going to sit here and forecast day rates. It's not, I don't have enough information. It's too far to my circle of competence. I do know the overall trend as a general investor is up. What I found interesting is that when you talk to one of the offshore service vessel providers, they will tell you that, you know, as boats come off contract, they're trying to keep the contract short because rates are just marching up the ladder and they're very profitable. Um, but let's say for some of those boats, they're around eighteen or $19,000 a day, which actually they can make a lot of good money at that. And they're starting to march up. For this particular operator, for them to be incentivized to go and get new boats built, they would need to see thirty-eight thousand dollars a day day rates and and have a, and have confidence that those day rates could be maintained for some period of time. That simply isn't going to happen. So this is your opportunity. The I call it the the scared factor, the scared factor arbitrage, right? And the um, PTSD arbitrage. That okay, we're going to do like our cousins exploration and production we're just going to now reap the surge of cash flow pay down debt get our operations squared away make some you know one-off acquisitions here and there small little things uh but we're not going to go on a building spree do i think that at some point that a couple years from now or three years from now if rates stay high and these guys are cash flush. I mean, these are depreciating assets, right? The life cycle of one of these boats or rigs is, you know, 15, 20, 25 years, depending on what you're talking about. So they have to be replaced eventually. Do I think that, you know, once I think that it would take a long time, I'm talking about a couple of years at least to change the mentality where then people would start to, you know, want to invest, uh, and I think, you know, once people, you know, what you're going to see, I think, is a lot of cash flow being recycled back to shareholders, like I said, just like you've seen in EMP via buybacks and dividends. And I'm very highly anticipating uh, Q4 earnings because in the guidance that we should see, because I think that a lot of guys are gushing to come out and tell how about how good their business is. Because I think it's really improved quite a bit. I think people are going to be shocked because really a lot of people haven't been talking about this. We've talked about it. Now you get this article from the Wall Street Journal. All of a sudden, day rates are above 400,000. Who knew, right? And why does that matter? Um, because if you look at this chart that was in the article, if you go back to prior to the 2014, these uh, little things represent contracts being signed, uh, drill ship lease prices per day from signed contracts. You see that we were you know, 500,000 to 600,000 range in a scatter plot, you know, back at the last boom. What is that inflation adjusted now? We're only, you know, starting to go above 400,000. We're seeing contracts signed at 425,000, 450,000. So we're starting to make the, the uh, this, this seems to be in place. So what derails this? Okay, well, if oil goes to 30 or 40 bucks and stays there, that probably puts this on, you know, you turn the heat down. It doesn't go away. It just goes into hiatus. Now these things are cashed up enough and have enough runway where they can make, the, they're not in debt, they can make it through. But eventually, you know, the lack of supply is going to run into the demand. You know, eventually, you know, we need the oil. The lack of investment is going to drive oil prices higher. What happens if you have a spike up to 150 or $200 a barrel in oil? What happens to the share prices of these things? So, you can play with the numbers. It's not good to try to forecast cyclical industries. You just try to find the overall trend. This is what we try to do. This is the trend. We were buying back in here. We kind of knew this was going to happen. We kind of suspected this would happen. And then here we are. We're in a definite uptrend. And, you know, do we get back to here? It's quite possible. Do we exceed it in some cases? I think it'll be possible. You know, and then once you see... Um, you know, guys starting to talk about, well, maybe we need to start refreshing our, we're going to start looking at refreshing our um, fleet because, you know, these are 
these assets only last so long. And that's when I'm heading for the hills. I'm selling out. So we've got a while to go. I think, you know, we've made pretty good money on some of the picks we've had. We also, I also like to buy like suppliers that are specialty suppliers of um, not just drillers, which everybody knows the names, but some other suppliers that make specialty equipment. That's a hard business to enter. Very highly technical, highly engineered, highly machine components that are needed for these deep water applications. And so I just expect to see continued um, these businesses as the reports come out just to be um, increasingly more positive. Again, here's from uh, Nine Point Partners up in Canada. It's a global onshore oil surplus versus uh, surplus deficit versus 2017, 2019 average. I mean, I meant to put here in the end fundamentals matter. I mean, here's where we're at. I mean, I've seen some, you know, in the last month, like in December, November of last year, you know, as sanctions were going to be put on Russian crude. I think the Russians really pushed a lot of crude into the market that had a that had a tendency to or had to put a wet blanket on the oil price. Not only that, I mean people haven't been paying attention, but the Iranians have really been exporting a lot more oil. And the kind of the Biden administration has been just looking the other way. They haven't really enforced the sanctions as heavily as they could have. Now Iran's nowhere close to its maximum production that it had experienced years ago, but they had a lot of oil on storage on shore and on tankers, and they've pushed a lot of that oil into the market. A lot of that oil has made it to China. So that's been kind of a wet blanket. So is that going to continue? I doubt it. Um, we'll see. There's, Like I said, there's so many components in the oil market uh, it's kind of hard to trade this. I don't, that's why I'm not a trader. I'm just saying, look, the insufficient, I just try to stick to the basic thesis. The demand for oil is going to increase. There's 6% depletion per year worldwide average. I don't see a really great substitute for oil. And until I see that, and I understand how, uh, I accept how, uh, instrumental it is how much it's needed the lifeblood of a modern economy i just don't see it going away when i see places like india china these other places in the in asia global east and global south africa with a billion people i mean i just don't see the demand going away uh, and i just do not see the sufficient supply so at some point you're going to need sustained higher prices to incentivize people to go out and get those marginal barrels. And I think that's where your opportunity is. In the meantime, yes, you're going to have cyclicality. You know, you're going to have, but you know, even with the United States in a recession, even with Europe in a recession, okay, with many countries in recession, the recession is getting worse. <sighs> you're still at $87 Brent. That's a lot of oil companies can make a lot of money at that, at that price. So we'll see. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the economy. I, did, I saw this chart, you know, again, I, I see these things on Twitter. I don't vouch for the 100% veracity of these things. I try to look it, look it up, but after the fact, but this is the um, percent of corporate bonds maturing in less than a year, year, less than or equal to one year. And this goes back to 93, you know, this is, you see a spike in 2008. Look at 2000, look at, look at now. We have like almost 70% of the corporate bonds are going to mature in the next year or less. And, you know, I don't know if that's a manifestation that a lot of people just went short term and rolled debt into short term to take advantage of these 5,000 year lows in interest rates. Didn't anticipate this interest rate spike. Now, if you're a zombie company and a lot like 25% or something like that of the companies uh, and the S&P, Or zombie companies. And what does that mean? They can't pay the interest. They don't generate sufficient cash flow to pay the interest on their debt. That was at a time when interest rates were low. Now you've got interest rates at, you know, decade level highs. You have to roll debt into that 
how does that happen? Are you going to be able to do that? Are you going to be able to make your interest payments? Are you going to be able to get refinanced when you roll your debt? And I think some other analysts that I've looked at, I like reading the Steve, Steve Blumenthal guy. Uh, he talks about this a lot. I think that, you know, as the, if the economy continues to deteriorate and you're going to start seeing it impacting sales, you're seeing these layoffs happen at a lot of companies now. Um, you're seeing, you know, we'll have to see like how things look, but if the economy's weakening and cash flows get uh, impacted and you have to roll debt into, you know, this tremendous amount of debt has to be rolled. And this isn't just corporate bond market. It's the same thing with the federal government. They have to roll like $7 billion, $7 trillion this year. So a lot of games were played. People didn't take advantage, I think, of the low interest rates to extend the terms of their debt. Um, I think they just rolled it short term to take advantage of, like I said, ze basically 0% interest rates. And then the Fed double clutched them. And when now we have these, you know, Jerome Powell is baby Volcker. And this is this could be a problem. But this will create an opportunity too, because again, guys, this could be the catalyst for the something this this is something that could break the corporate bond market right and companies going into bankruptcy or going into receivership or having to restructure because again we have so many zombie companies you know when you have low rates low interest rates a lot of businesses that shouldn't exist stay in existence or get started and what you have with this it's like picking up a that two by or that four by eight sheet of plywood that's been sitting in your backyard for the last year and a half you know you don't want to just put your fingers under there and lift it up because you don't know what's hiding under there you want to get like a shovel and it could be snakes under there scorpions and anthill who knows what and that's kind of what we've got now you know we've raised the rates we've put the sunshine onto the darkness and we've exposed potentially you know a bunch of problems here and so this could create an opportunity because what will happen is corporate bond rates will spike, companies will go, uh, companies will start, you know, not being able to refinance or they may be going to bankruptcy. That causes a ripple effect across. People start looking at, oh my goodness, what about this company? It could go bankrupt. Some of them won't. I mean, during the 2008 great financial crisis, there was a time to be a buyer of corporate bonds and you could lock in double digit, high double digit rates yield to maturity you know 20 percent, 25 percent uh that could happen again so we'll have to see see how this uh if this is in fact accurate i'll be looking you know looking for some more information but this is what i've talked about when i talked about you know buying that uh pro share short corporate bond fund it hasn't really moved too much it's kind of been staying around you know the, the level where we bought it slightly lower but you know that might be a good thing you can look at later this year because if you're of the view that Mr. Powell is going to keep rates higher for a longer length of time, then I don't know how these corporations are going to roll all this debt. You're going to see some corporations go away. And again, the Federal Reserve will react like it always does. It will it will lower rates and create liquidity, even if it has to buy corporate bonds, which it did during the pandemic. It didn't buy that many, but just saying they would buy them, everybody front front runs it and then money comes into to these markets so something to watch uh we haven't got to the that point yet but this could be another catalyst that leads to something breaking and mr powell having to reverse his uh tightening and go for another liquidity cycle again this is why you know I'm hesitant, you know, I listen to some podcasts. Uh I like this wealthy on Adam Taggart podcasts. He does a lot of podcasts and he doesn't just do the standard thing with the same people. He gets these got people on there that you really haven't heard of or aren't talked about, like some people this one woman she he had on there about how the Airbnb thing was coming apart. You had so many knuckleheads get into that because that's what happens, right? All of the that was the shiny object. You can go get free money, buy a townhouse and a or a condo or whatever, or a house in some area that's desirable to vacation in. And anybody can be an Airbnb, you know, landlord. So everybody was doing that. Well, that's ending. Okay. That how was that going to affect? And same thing with cars. You know, I listened to this thing. It was a guy's name was Lucky Lopez. He's like a car guy. I mean, 20 years in the car thing. 
and he had him on and he was talking about the guy was pretty funny too but it's just like what he he has never seen in 20 years how wild it got again people were just you know you you didn't have to have a job you just had stimulus checks that was good enough they were putting people into these vehicles you know we highlighted this before with the people with the thousand dollar a month car payments or truck payments that's crazy guys and so what you're going to have now is all of these vehicles being repossessed all people can't pay now they should have never been put into these vehicles but of course greed and the and the the time you know people are just going to push this stuff because it's all about you know how are people incentivized get them in a car i get my commission i'm out you know it's somebody else's problem so here is another situation where you have the u.s savings rate versus credit card debt now you look at prior to the pandemic uh things were not really super great with the economy anyways you had credit card debt had been climbing for several years why is that? Because people's wages in this country, their ability to, their standard of living is going down over time. And so they have to compensate to try to hold their standard of living, try to keep buying and doing the same things that they did in the past that they can't afford now with debt. And so that's why you saw credit card debt slowly climbing. So what happened is you had the pandemic, you closed the economy. Well, nobody could do anything. So debt dropped off um, and free money went out. And so this was interesting and people were lauding this, you know, various economists on podcasts. Yeah, the savings rate is, you know, at historic highs. But I mean, yeah, if I if if I put trillions of dollars into any economy directly into people's bank accounts, we can have a good time, too. And so that's what happened. Right. Credit card debt went down because everybody was cash flush, but, you know, out there just buying stuff. Nobody was working. People were living off the government, extended unemployment benefits. You know the score. Well, that starts to end now. Uh, free money goes away. People start spending down their savings, right? That's what they do. You give money to the average person because people's time preferences are skewed uh, incorrectly, in my view. People don't defer consumption or defer their pleasure. They, they, Most people, if you give them $100, they run out and spend it. That's what they do, um, unfortunately. They don't save for a rainy day. They don't think long term. It's just, you know let me get that dopamine rush. I want to get that new phone. I want to go get that Dodge Challenger. They're going to, you know, sign and drive, easy financing and off to the races. So that's what happened. So now look where we're at. All that's went away now. People's savings rate is down, you know, below what it had been in the past, historically, at least for the last five or six, seven years. And look at credit card debt. Okay. So how is the economy going to be good? And you're raising rates. Now unemployment's starting to come. People can't pay. Okay, we saw it. We're seeing it. The housing market. Nobody's buying houses. Yet yeah, the very high end, okay, where people have a lot of money and they can be cash buyers and it doesn't affect them. But if you're just, you know, a 25-year-old engineer and your wife is a teacher in the local high school and you want to go get a starter home and uh, you're priced out right now. So... Prices are coming down. Uh, no houses are being sold. A lot of multifamily is still going up around where I'm living here because, you know, I drive around my area and stick my nose into what's going on in these markets because I think there's going to be a tremendous opportunity, especially in a place like Houston or Austin. With prices come down, which they will, to buy at the bottom because we will get, we will get what we always get, okay? The... If you haven't figured this out, this is the argument I had with people before, you know, about inflation, about the government's ability to create inflation, about the government's ability to uh, do what's needed to be done. You saw during the pandemic, if they want to create inflation, if they want to create economic activity, that was helicopter money. OK, they put the money directly into people's bank accounts and their pockets and they went out and spent and you got inflation and you got nominal economic activity. OK, because people but it was it, it it's just like if you give you know a hyperactive kid let him drink two or three bottles of pop and three little debbies uh nobody's getting sleep in that house that night because the kid's going to be bouncing off the walls eventually that sugar goes through his system and the and the kid collapses and sleeps for 10 hours straight okay so this is what we're experiencing now again i'm not an ec economist 
you know, maybe there's been past periods where we've seen divergences like this and, and everything worked out fine. We get a soft landing. I don't see it. But I think that if you keep your dry powder, what I'm doing is this. I'm still holding because I think what's going on in the rest of the world around commodities uh, is still a potential benefit. Because I think I am certain almost 100%. You can never be 100%, but I'm very certain that when this thing starts going off the rails, the Fed and the government are going to do what they always do. The Fed's going to cut rates very quickly. They're going to reactivate QE. And the government's going to do physical pro fiscal programs. They demonstrated they can do it, and if it's necessary, they will do it. Okay, they're not going to. There's not going to be austerity, which we should have. We're at 32 trillion dollars in debt. We're never going to pay the debt back, and this cycles will continue until they can't continue anymore. That's the future of the West. The debt cycle will continue until it simply cannot continue anymore. I mean, I was listening to a podcast with Felix Zuloff who's a Swiss-based money manager, very smart guy, used to be on the Barron's Roundtable. He made the comment two or three years ago on a podcast where he said, I don't see any reason by the end of this decade, he's talking about the 2020s, why can't the Fed's balance sheet be $40 trillion? Who thought it could get to 8 or $9 trillion? Why not $40 trillion? Why not $50 trillion? At what point does the currency succumb to that pressure? You know, Once the currency breaks, that's what will be the catalyst in my view. OK, and we're seeing a little bit of that in Japan. But you see, Japan has debt to GDP like double or triple what we have in the United States. And the place is still fine. I mean, people live there. There's no deprivation going on. So as Adam Smith said, there's a lot of ruin in the country. So you have to be very careful about predicting the end of the world economically and things like that. In the end, we know historically that great empires uh, that were had everything going for them, they usually end because they succumb to moral degradation, financial uh, spending too much money, and military expansionism that can't be maintained. And they kind of all three tie together, in my view, okay? And that's what you have in the United States. I mean, come on, guys. Uh, do you... You know, and I wrote an article like five years ago. It's on my website. You know, I did a riff on the Blue Oyster Cult song, you know, Don't Fear the Reaper, some of the lyrics, you know, another 10,000 coming every day. That's baby boomers taking Medicare and Social Security. That goes on for the rest of this decade. Every single day, 10,000 more hit the ranks. We don't have the money. So eventually this goes on, it goes on, it goes on until, you know, it breaks. It's like somebody that smokes, you know, they don't have cancer their first two or three years. They don't have cancer after 10 or 20 years. Then all of a sudden they start coughing up blood when they're 69 or 70 years old. They've been smoking for 40 years and they go in and they find out they have terminal cancer and it's over. So, I mean, whatever analogy you want to use, you know, that's how it works. But you have to be careful because you have these perma bears out there and that can lead to, um, uh, you leaving a lot of money on the table. I've told the story before about many people I know that allow biases or their view on the current political people in political power to skew their view. And I will go back to what Stanley Druckenmiller said. Okay. This is why you have to read people that are smart and have had success in investing. Okay. And listen to what they say because success leaves clues. In the short term in the market, the market's driven by liquidity and sentiment in the medium and long term it's in the medium it's kind of a combination of fundamentals and liquidity and sentiment but in the long term it's driven by fundamentals that's it so you have to be a little bit nimble you have to understand these things you have to accept them um this doesn't mean this tells me that we're closer to the end of the liquidity uh, liquidity tightening than the than the beginning you know as i said before this journey to higher interest rates just started basically a year ago. And so a lot of the rate rate, rate increases have not made their way into the, through the economy and affected the economy yet. That's still coming. The first wave has hit. Now the second wave and third and fourth waves will hit. I think that the Federal Reserve will reverse course well before that. I think probably sometime in the third or fourth quarter, um, the panic's going to set in because what's the trajectory for the economy? You know, people, you know, 
this is not sustainable. The U.S. economy is a 80% consumer spending based uh, um, economy. And so as people's savings rates are down, their ability to spend credit card debt, this stuff becomes overwhelming. You have to stop spending. And if you lose your job, then you're really up a creek without a paddle. So again, I'm not an economist. I don't want to just use one chart. You, know, you look at the leading economic indicators, they've been down for months. That's usually a precursor to recession. I mean, a lot of things you can look at, inverted yield curves. And we see this, I saw this in the last two major recessions that I've seen. You have various people in the financial media, Bloomberg, CNBC, Wall Street Journal, whatever, they always bias towards this time it's different because they're incentivized to do that. Bull markets mean more assets under management for money management firms, more fees, more fees, more assets under management, more advertising in the Wall Street Journal and on Bloomberg, blah, 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 blah. You see how this works? How are people incentivized? This is why, you know, you had such uh, the journalism was compromised during the lockdowns and during the pandemic. I mean, I don't have a television here. I don't really watch these new shows for years now but i remember when i did watch them on all of channels they were predominantly the advertisers were the pharmaceutical companies why would journalism journalists who get their money from the pharmaceutical industry go and do real journalism about you know pharmaceutical companies come on guys show me the incentives i'll tell you the outcome this is human nature this is human psychology all right, got a little bit off track there, but uh, I think you get the point. Getting to uranium miners. Again, this came from uh, Twitter. Again, getting back to what I've talked to like a couple weeks ago in one of the videos to try to calm people down. I mean, uranium miners have been the best investment for the last three years. Well, relative to these other ones, I mean, U.S. equities, U.S. bonds, U.S. dollar and commodities miners have outperformed now you see where it's kind of you know you had this topping out and then well is it topped out and coming down well you had a big move higher you know even before this you had this big move basically and this is in my view digesting that and that i feel like you'll be well, we're going to be moving higher and you're already seeing like in the last couple of weeks um, you've seen several of the uranium stocks, Cameco, Kaz Adam Prom, Denison, break out on the charts. Now, I don't like to be a chart watcher. I'm just suggesting that's what you're seeing. So, um, again, take this under consideration right here. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. But I don't think we've seen the top in your in this move in uranium miners. And I, and I said before, it would be a multi-year situation. I think I said it on Jesse Day's program when he interviewed me. Um, recently i think that the move will be a lot longer and more sustained so we'll see but uh again this should give you comfort if you've been holding these you've outperformed the overall market you're ahead you're a winner again the problem is and i say this all the time is you have to set your expectations to be realistic the problem is is that you get guys that think they're investing you know they got in on the on cryptocurrency craze they were making hundreds of percent a week or a month or they caught a coin that you know went up ten thousand percent and they think they're like a professional investor now you got lucky guy you got lucky you hit the lottery you're not a, you're not an investor that's not normal what happened that was a manifestation of several things uh predominantly easy money by the world's central banks that enabled that to happen, to enable that speculative bubble to happen. Now, a lot of people at me now, you got the Bitcoin bros out there. A lot of them have went went away or went back to, you know, being a short order cook at Denny's or cleaning carpets for their uncle, carpet cleaning business. But there's still guys out there that don't understand. Yes, the blockchain is a great technology, but it's not really super leap and integrated. But the idea that all of these coins and these guys were trading these things and all this stuff they were doing, that was a speculative bubble. Okay. So you're not a so if you think that that's investing and you have the view that your returns should be hundreds of percent a year every year, I mean, what are you thinking about? 
I've told people before, go look at the greatest investors. Go to Compounding Quality's website. I put it up uh, the last video the video before. He has thousand pages of pages in PDF form of great investors, of their letters, of their interviews. They explain to you how this works. Go look at Krem Watsa at, at Fairfax Financial. He does it just like Warren Buffett. You go to their annual report, the first page is their historical returns every year. Same thing with Berkshire. Same thing with a lot of these guys. And you will see they did not make, these guys are all billionaires. You're not a billionaire. They're not reporting hundreds of percent a year, okay? Averaging somewhere, the greatest investors that, if you want to look at their returns, the average is probably somewhere between 15 and 20% a year overall average. Yes, that's encompassing all their down years. And they do have down years. You can increase your odds like Warren Buffett. I like what Warren Buffett said. You know, he said if he was managing a small amount of money, say a million dollars a year, or something like a couple few million, he could definitely make 50% a year. And I agree with him because you can see that you can play in areas like small caps or some of these cyclical turnarounds where most money managers can't play. Okay, they're restricted or they can't get enough money like in this uranium market. It's tough to get big money into this. Now, I think it will come, but you know, you can't buy small cap mining stocks if you're, it's outside the scope of what's, you know, uh, proper fiduciary responsibility when running a fund, okay? You can't get too super speculative. And so you can, though, as an individual investor. And so I remember Buffett saying that, you know, uh, I think I could do, I think the exact quote was something like, I think I could do 50% or more a year if he was running a small money. And then he kind of paused and said, no, I know I could do it. Because if you sift through, there's really those opportunities. There's, I sift through the new highs every day, the new lows, um, I do screens of stocks that have market caps below certain amounts. I look at the CAPE ratios of these other markets around the world and see how cheap they are because that's where your opportunity is. And most people are not going to go there. Okay. And you have to have the realistic expectations. If you found a thousand dollar bill or a gold ring in the gutter, then count yourself lucky. Uh, if you hit the lotto, you know, count yourself lucky, but that doesn't make you a good investor. You got lucky. And if you made hundreds of percent in cryptocurrencies, you're not, you, you, you rode the wave that you know, you're not going to do that every year. And if you think you are, you're going to be unsuccessful because you're going to take such high risk. You're going to get rug pulled over and over. Okay. Believe me, I've been down that road. This is part of what I'm trying to teach people on this channel. Okay. I am in my mid fifties. I made a lot of mistakes in my early investing career. And my returns were not consistent. I missed out on a lot of compounding. Yes, I had some years where I was up triple digits. And then I give back half of it. I should have already been retired, but I got greedy during the great, right before the great financial crisis. All right. I started having linear thinking. I got caught up in the FOMO and I lost a lot of money. I should already be done. Okay. Now I've recovered and done nicely since then. And I've incorporated all these ideas. I have went back and read Okay, and learned from these other investors. I finally realized I say, like, how are they getting these consistent returns? And then I read and read and read and incorporated it into my investing repertoire. Okay, because this is a craft, like cabinet making's a craft, you know, paintings a craft, uh, you know, certain things, furniture, you know, these people that are highly skilled at doing something, you know, taking a junk car and restoring it, you know, these are very skilled things same thing with investing and if you think you're just going to cruise the internet or twitter or glom onto some youtube video personality that's not how this works and if you think that you know you are going to get above average returns every year that even better than the greatest investors that are already billionaires it's not going to happen you're going to get you're you're going to have that one or two up years like you had in your cryptocurrency career and like i said you're back there shampooing rugs for your uncle's carpet cleaning business or you know working at the bar at applebees on friday and saturday night so understand that you know some of the gains we've had in the news we've had companies in there perform hundreds and hundreds of percent okay i don't give advice but i would tell people you know don't try to squeeze the juice out of the 
the last piece of juice. If you have returns like that, take some down. Be realistic. Understand what's real, okay, and what's realistic, okay? You should be happy and you should enjoy your success, but understand that sometimes we get lucky in this business too, it's, okay? A lot of times we get lucky. All right, I kind of went on again, but I want to keep reiterating this, guys, because, you know, there's been a lot of uh, people are down, they're blaggering uranium mining, and it's this is over. How come it's, and it all comes down to how come it's not doing what I want it to do on my time frame? Well, as, as before, I've said this before, that's not how this works. So, again, this is a slide from Sprott. These are like the previous uranium bull markets, if you will. This is the current one. Um, I think it will be, you know, you see the previous ones, bull market one was up uh, 629% in 5.3 years. Bull market two, up 18%, 1,800% in 6.5 years. And now we're in bull market three, with the question mark. Uh, 168% in 6.1 years. So are we at the end of the current run or are we looking at what you have seen before where, you know, do we get the exponential move higher? Uh, does this go to the next level and we get the, you know, several, I still think there's a lot of room in this. So we'll see. Um, I think in the, at least in this last bull market that I was part of or saw, we didn't have the same amount of demand and the same amount of construction going on and commissioning of new reactors. So we have a different dynamic now here. I don't even know if this applies. This was way back in the 60s. But um, I, I, I still think that, uh, you know, there is no shortage of uranium in the earth. If you get to a certain price, sufficient investment will come and it will make that those ordinary street profits go away for whoever the, the miners are. But that takes time again. It's not happening as quickly. Uh, it's the same with all mining. That's the opportunity. So I just wanted to point that out. This I thought this was a really good slide that you know this bull market really hasn't even got going yet. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. Uh, appreciate the um, again. Oh, I forgot. Thank you very much. We are over ten thousand subscribers on YouTube. I think that gives me enough. If you notice, I haven't been doing a lot of interviews of people. I'm going to start doing that. I, I wanted to get over 10,000 subscribers. I think it's a kind of a threshold that gives you some more legitimacy. You're not just some goofball. You know, a lot of people now are doing interviews. There's a lot of people. I'm not saying that all these guys are goofballs, but there's a lot of people wanting to interview. And this gives us, you know, it's like, hey, I can at least say I got an audience of 10,000 subscribers. These are like people that are, it's not a um, pump type you know, channel, we're serious people talking about these issues. We want to learn from experts like yourself. And I think this gives us the, uh, the critical mass, the gravitas to get some, you know, pretty good thought leaders on where they'll think it's worth my time to go on here for 40 minutes if I can talk to 10,000 people. So uh, I thank you for that. It's been a long journey. It's been because of the audience. Um, and, you know, like I said before, I freely admit I don't always get it right. We have really good people here that keep me in check. My editors that have been with me, call them editors, if you will, guys that say, hey, you got that wrong or you got that name wrong or that number's wrong. And we're quick to correct. You know, if we're wrong, we want to correct. We want to make sure. And so I appreciate you guys. I've had guys that have been with me from day one or people that have been with me from day one. I appreciate you all. I really appreciate the people that have come on recently. If you get value out of this, again, if you think this is useful to you, um, the best way you can help me is to just like like the videos, you know, share them, make comments. Uh, again, if you're interested in understanding, you know, possible ways to take advantage financially of the ideas we talk about in these videos, we offer a subscription to the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter which you can subscribe. The subscribe information is in the show notes below the video. And, uh, you know, we'd be happy to have you as a subscriber to that and see if, uh, you know, you would enjoy that. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Thanks a lot. And we'll talk to you next week.